tie a yellow ribbon. Sermon for May 24th. Tie a yellow ribbon. Tie a yellow ribbon round the old oak tree became an unlikely hit song in 1973. The song's title referred to the practice of families who had a loved one sent to fight in the Vietnam War. Families would tie a yellow ribbon around a tree, symbolizing that they were waiting and praying that their family member would return safely. The ribbon conveyed awareness that someone was absent from a family or from a community. Tie a red ribbon. Out of the HIV AIDS epidemic, the red ribbon emerged as a powerful symbol. It meant remembering those who died from HIV AIDS. It meant inclusion of those living with HIV AIDS. It signaled a commitment to working for a cure, for medical research, and for so much more. Tie a red, white, and blue ribbon Following the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, the red, white, and blue ribbon emerged as a symbol for remembering the nearly 3,000 people who had died. It was a symbol of mourning, of remembrance, and also a symbol of unity and resilience. Tie a yellow ribbon. Tie a red ribbon. Tie a red, white, and blue ribbon. I found it striking that two and a half months into our lives being upended by the COVID-19 pandemic, with now approximately 100,000 deaths in the United States, there is really no widespread symbol we might attach to what we're living through. No symbol of mourning, no symbol of remembering, no symbol signifying a collective spirit, not even a colored ribbon that I know of. Of course, we're living in a divided country. People are putting themselves into camps, the camps of keep it all closed or open it all back up. But our nation was extraordinarily divided by the Vietnam War. And through the first several years of the AIDS epidemic, the Reagan White House not only ignored the disease, but considered it a joke. The red ribbon, the red ribbon had to combat the forces of stigmatization and homophobia and division. September 11th was followed by a period of remarkable unity and international goodwill, which was quickly squandered. I puzzled. I puzzled, I am puzzled by this conspicuous absence of any sort of symbol, any sort of ribbon. As we pass the tragic milestone of 100,000 deaths in our country, a milestone we seem like we're going to pass this weekend, it appears exceedingly unlikely and more unlikely each and every day that there will be any sort of solemn national recognition. No national day of mourning, no moment of silence. I was puzzled and perplexed by this until I read a piece by the journalist David Siegel from about uh, 10 days ago entitled, Why? Are there almost no memorials to the flu of 1918? Why are there almost no memorials to the flu of 1918? In this piece, Siegel explores this question. You have this pandemic a century ago that kills some 50 million people worldwide, 675,000 of them in the United States. And there is virtually no memorial to this having ever happened. Siegel sent out, set out to try to find memorials to the flu of 1918. And he found a bench in a cemetery in a small town in Vermont and a plaque in New Zealand. And that's about it. Not only 
are there virtually no physical memorials, but Siegel also noted, quote, but soon after the pandemic ended and for decades after, the pandemic somehow vanished from the public imagination. With rare exceptions, it didn't crop up in novels, paintings, plays, or movies. Even scholars overlooked the subject. The first major scholarly account of the flu was published nearly 60 years later, in 1976, by Alfred Crosby, a historian who was baffled by the absence of any impression left by the disaster. Isn't that interesting? I find it fascinating, fascinating that you could live through a worldwide upheaval, a pandemic that swept through our country, swept through the entire world, and then after, it was something that seemingly nobody talked about, that seemingly everybody decided to keep silent about. Why is this? Siegel suggests as one possibility that World War I stole the headlines. He offers another explanation that the, after the pandemic, people just grew tired of it and wanted to forget and move on. I don't find these explanations that satisfying, and for me it remains a question. How do we explain today's absence of a ribbon, of mourning, of moments of silence. For me, this explanation is that it's grounded in denial. It's grounded in a politics of denial, a denial based in shame and blame. We are not likely to speak the truth because if the truth of the light of truth shines upon us, it doesn't make us look good. And so there is denial. For politicians to hold a day of mourning would be to admit that something bad is actually happening, which many seem incapable of admitting. On a social level, on a societal level, we know that national amnesia is nothing new. Our nation is really well practiced in amnesia. At the end of March, I preached about the pilgrimage to Selma and Montgomery that a group in our church had been planning. At the center of that pilgrimage was to be a visit to the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, a project aimed at confronting our national amnesia around lynching and dedicated to the remembrance of that horrible legacy. We know that our national memory is so very weak when it comes to remembering the legacy of slavery, when it comes to remembering the Native American genocide, when it comes to remembering so much. On a social level, though, we also understand, we're coming to understand that historical amnesia is a symptom of sickness at the level of society. It's a sign that we might be unwell, that the only way to wellness is to practice truth and reconciliation, telling of these stories. There is a need to remember, and the act of remembrance is an act that saves our souls. I've been thinking a lot about remembrance at a personal level, the level of a family, a congregation, a community. There is this deep need for rituals of remembrance. That's my job a lot of the time, is to provide these rituals of remembrance. There's a human need for them. One of the tremendous cruelties of this moment is the fact that there is just no good way to hold a memorial service right now. And families who lose a loved one face choices, none of which are ideal. To gather in a tiny group of no more than 10 or 12, to hold a memorial service on Zoom, 
to wait to do it later, whenever that is, and live with it hanging over your head for as long as that takes. As a minister, I know there is a need to mourn and there is a need to grieve. Earlier in the service this morning, I asked Sarah Clark Farnell, a member of our church, to lead a piece about communal mourning. Sarah had taken a class uh, this past semester around rituals, around death and dying. And so I asked her to create a piece. And she created this beautiful prayer, naming and honoring and affirming the vicissitudes of grief we may be experiencing in this moment. Earlier in the service, worship associate Susan McDaniel shared an opening reading with stirring words. I shall fill my days, but I shall not, cannot forget. Earlier in the service, Julie Pendleton sang two pieces, two pieces that became popular during World War II, popular songs naming the difficulty of distance and of absence. And earlier in the service, our wonderful singers sang my favorite hymn in the hymnal, All My Memories of Love. The words to this gorgeous hymn conjure an image of a memorial tree, a weeping willow dedicated to those souls we've lost to tears. There's a human need to grieve. There is a human need to remember. There's a need for communal mourning. There is a need for communal remembrance. And there's a power in remembering. There is a power in that red ribbon signifying that this is something we see, something we acknowledge, something we will remember, something that we will fight for, something that we will work towards overcoming. That red ribbon is a symbol of power. There's a power in the pink ribbon that is associated with breast cancer. Breast cancer. I once had a parishioner whose job was to be a nurse navigator for those with breast cancer, and I once went out with her for a long coffee to learn as much from her as I could. And she described how for some women, the pink ribbon becomes this symbol of transcendent collective power. It symbolizes you are not alone that you are facing cancer not alone, but as a part of a sisterhood of millions. There is a power, there is a power in remembrance. I think of Jesus' words, do this in remembrance of me. I'd love to conclude this sermon by announcing that I've found some color of ribbon or designed some symbol that I could give to all of you. I'd love to think that I could come up with some idea that would sweep across the world and we'd all start tying colored ribbons and out of remembrance, we could rise up in an understanding of our collective power. As a minister, I try to avoid delusions of grandeur. But who knows, maybe, maybe one of you will come up with a fitting symbol. But I would commend to you the much more humble and meaningful act of remembering. Perhaps take a few words from Sarah Clark Farnell's litany, or from Susan McDaniel's opening words, or from Julie Pendleton's musical presentation, or from that beautiful hymn, All My Memories of Love. The most important thing, though, is not to remember alone. It is to remember together. It is to hold your grief and another person's grief together, to join together, to be together, to remember together. Amen and blessed be. I love you and I'm with you. Amen.